Hey YouTubers, welcome to Costume Cinematographico, where I profile costumes from some of my favorite television shows and movies. In this episode, I will be profiling the costumes of Marjorie Terrell from all six seasons of the HBO series Game of Thrones, so careful for any spoilers for the entire six seasons. Marjorie Terrell is a beautiful and clever young queen of the Seven Kingdoms. She is portrayed by British actress Natalie Dormer. Before Game of Thrones, she was best known for her role as Anne Boleyn on the Showtime series The Tudors. Marjorie's paternal grandmother is Lady Olenna Tyrell, the de facto matriarch of House Tyrell. Because of her prickly nature and witty barbs, she is also known as the Queen of Thorns in reference to the Tyrell sigil of a rose. Her father is Lady Olenna's eldest son, Lord Mace Tyrell, the Lord of Highgarden and the head of House Tyrell. Marjorie's younger brother is Loras Tyrell, heir to Highgarden and ranked as one of the most skilled knights in Westeros. Marjorie Tyrell might be based upon the real-life 15th century historical figure Anne Neville, Queen Consort of England. Seen in a promotional photo from the BBC production of The White Queen, actor Faye Marcy from Game of Thrones portrays the young queen. And like Marjorie, her family was very wealthy and her father betrothed her as a young woman to two men who would be the kings. Anne Neville's father, Warwick the Kingmaker, betrothed his youngest daughter at the tender age of 14 to Edward, Prince of Wales. Warwick sealed an alliance to the House of Lancaster in the same way that Marjorie's father, Mace Tyrell, betrothed Marjorie to seal an alliance with the Baratheons. After 17-year-old Prince of Wales died in battle, Anne married her cousin and childhood friend Richard, Duke of Gloucester, just two years later. She was just 16. Years later, she was crowned Queen Consort upon the coronation of her husband, Richard III. She would die of tuberculosis five months before the death of Richard at age, 20, at age 28 years old. Anne Neville's childhood home was Warwick Castle in Warwickshire, England, like Marjorie's own High Garden. The original wooden Moat and Bailey Castle was built in stone in the 12th century. House Tyrell of Highgarden is one of the great and wealthiest houses of the Seven Kingdoms. Their coat of arms is a golden rose on a green field, named so for the fields of golden roses at Highgarden that stretch as far as the eye can see. We first meet Marjorie at King Renly's camp in the Stormlands during the third episode of season two. Because this is the first look we get of Marjorie, it's hard to know what style originates from Highgarden and what she has incorporated from the Baratheons into her queenly attire. We know from seeing Elena and Marjorie's handmaidens in later episodes that the symmetrical blue-gray turquoise and gold brocade vest or jacket and the silky flowing skirts are a staple for the Tyrell women. Marjorie wears a flowing gray cape with an unusual hanging gold bead fastener and has added an emerald green neck scarf to this gown, a color that originates from her family crest and then is adopted in a less vibrant fashion into King Renly's sigil and banners. In the season two episode, The Ghost of Harrenhal, Marjorie wears a funnel dress that makes her look like a human burrito in Chesterfield upholstery. For the most part, I have adored the work of principal costume designer Michelle Clapton, but in my opinion, this costume is a miss. Clapton defends her design in this statement saying, from the very beginning, Marjorie is brave and experimental in her look, which I wanted. She was a young girl who wanted to be queen, so the funnel neck dress was ridiculous, but she's just a teenage girl trying things out. Clapton adds that Marjorie's funnel dress was obviously a homage to the wonderful Alexander McQueen's costume for Bjork. It just felt right uh, that this young, ambitious girl would be experimenting with shapes, honing her skills, which we now see her employing to great effect. It was a risk and divided the audience. 
For the season finale, Valor Morgalis, Marjorie's look encompasses elements from her other two costumes, a symmetrical brocade vest with a deeply plunging neckline with a neck scarf tucked deeply into the vest front and flowing skirt from her first costume, and long off the shoulder and what I speculate are detachable sleeves from her funnel dress. Again, the costume is in gray-blue tones with the dangling rose bauble to accentuate her cleavage. By season two, Marjorie has adapted a distinctive style and signature color. According to Clapton, color plays a pivotal role in foreshadowing characters' futures. Clapton says, we do all these sort of secret symbols, color hints about the way the court is being influenced. They are just little things that people may not notice unless they really look. The Tyrells, especially Marjorie, are dressed in shades of blue and teal in combinations with metallics like gold and bronze, while the Lannisters are dressed in red tones derived from their family sigil. But why should this be the color palette for the Tyrells when clearly their sigil tinctures are emerald green and golden yellow? While this might be pure speculation, the idea for colors might originate from the color palette of two other famous fictional families, the Capulets and the Montagues from Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. The Montagues and the Capulets are two feuding families of Verona. Likewise, before the Tyrells switched sides to join the Lannisters in the Battle of Blackwater, they too were at odds with one another. You can see here that the Capulet family sigil is red and yellow, while the Montague sigil is blue and yellow. I'm not sure where the color classification for Shakespeare's tragic families began, but it was certainly made famous by director Franco Zeffirelli in his 1968 film, Romeo and Juliet. Here is an exhibit of costume designer Danilo Donato's outfits for the Starshuck lovers from the masquerade ball scene, Juliet's red gown on the left and Romeo's blue doublet and tights on the right from an exhibit. In the season three debut, Valor de Har, Marjorie stops to visit with small folk and hand out food in Flea Bottom. While it's difficult to tell, this is actually the same costume from the season two finale. But what's different is that she's no longer wearing the sleeves or the brown silk scarf and has replaced it with a matching blue neck scarf. Michelle Clapton explains it like this. Marjorie Terrell sweeps into King's Landing and takes it by storm. As such, her wardrobe is very unique and very much at odds with everything else. It's a very structured look. The new style coming in after the war. For the first time in a long time, Cersei won't be the trendsetter in the capital. It's a fun way to reflect their future rivalry. Marjorie also wears a blue pashmina style wrap and her hair is slightly upswept with hanging tendrils. If you saw my Cersei video, you might remember that she embellished her beautiful gowns with bits of armor and the more paranoid she became, the more elaborate the armor became. According to designer Clapton, it is just the opposite for Marjorie. Her saying, Cersei is forced to wear even more elaborately embroidered armored dresses in an attempt to show her strength and her rightful place, where Marjorie merely has to reveal her youthful flesh in a series of not so accidentally revealing dresses. Natalie Dormer explains that her wig is the beginning of how she gets into character. The key is the wig, Dormer says. The hair department on Game of Thrones is incredible. I go from my long blonde hair to this brunette color. I look in the mirror in the hair chair and that's when I see Marjorie. Hair designer Kevin Alexander explains the transition of her hair from season two to three. We pulled so much hair away, so it makes her more distinctive and different from everyone else. With Marjorie, I wanted a lot more to be showing. I wanted a lot more flesh on her. In episode seven, The Bear and the Maiden Fair, Marjorie dons this two-section gown with optimal skin exposure. In stark contrast to Sansa's gown, the top portion features a seafoam blue and gold brocade bodice with a plunging center front and short cap sleeves. 
The full paper silk circle skirt and bodice are trimmed with silk velvet ribbon and the sections are joined at the center front with a bronze metal rose and metal rose vines. You can't see it in these photos, but the skirt overlaps in the front and at times reveals a crinoline of sorts. In a close-up shot of the detachable rose and vine embellishment, you can see that there are white thorns on the vine and that it is attached with thin blue ribbons. The back looks in the style of Princess Jasmine's costume from Aladdin with the silk velvet cross pieces and pointed waistband. Here is a close-up detail of Marjorie's rose picture on the bottom and also Elena's is on the top. The piece was commissioned by Steenson's Jewelers in North Ireland and according to their website each individual petal was rolled and shaped by hand using copper clay. The vine work was formed from brass wire and a mold was taken from real rosebuds to cast the beautiful silver bud details. During a dinner party in which Marjorie wears her cut-out dress, she admires Cersei's armor while Cersei jabs at Marjorie about her lack of coverage. Michelle Clapton explains, Marjorie's in great competition with Cersei, which plays out in season three. It's almost like a fashion fight between them, which is quite funny. Cersei's armor corset is to show power, but then Marjorie undermines her with the girlish, revealing simplicity of her new dresses. It's a dangerous game. In episode two, Marjorie meets with Sansa and her grandmother to get the truth about Joffrey. Marjorie wears a similar gown to her other looks. This slightly asymmetrical halter bodice is constructed in blue and gold silk satin brocade with blue-gray velvet cap sleeves not fully attached at the front. Again, the silk skirt is an overlapping full circle that is seamed into the bodice. She wears the same rose and vine belt detail, also attached with fine ribbons. The gown is mostly backless with cap sleeves, a yoke at the nape of the neck, and the bodice scoops deeply and ends just above her natural waistline. The color of this gown seems to change with the lighting, going from light blue-gray to deep Wedgwood blue, like in episode eight, The Bear and the Maiden Fair. In the season four opener, Two Sorts, we see another look for Marjorie in keeping with her other blue-hued gowns. This one consists of a halter brocade bodice and slightly asymmetrical overlapping front closure with a deeply V neckline. Her arms and shoulders are bare except for the floating cap sleeves. The full length flowing skirt is constructed from a lightweight silk and finished off with a silk velvet belt that wraps around and crosses her back. Marjorie wore this gown previously in the season three episode, and now his watch is ended, when Joffrey gives her a tour of the Great Sept of Baylor. The fabric of the bodice is a pattern motif in shades of blues and bronzes. Here's a close-up look at the bias cut belt with a bronze metal closure and floating shoulder cuffs in bias cut gray velvet and bronze twill, swing tacked and attached at the halter top. In the season four episode, The Lion and the Rose, Marjorie marries Joffrey in this unique silk and linen royal wedding dress, covered with creeping briar roses, thorns and all. Michelle Clapton explains her concept for the gown saying, I wanted it to be sort of a quite traditional dress in a funny way, but then again, roses can be so pretty and I didn't want her to be pretty. I wanted her to be slightly dangerous. Hence, the metal rose vines running along her dress, which subtly are spiked with metal thorns if you look closely, showing her danger underneath. Embroidery artist Michelle Carragher elaborates on the design saying, Marjorie's wedding dress has a simple, seductive shape, but the tangled, thorny stems are there as a web-like trap to capture and snare their prey, and the roses cascade and spill down covering the ground, slowly spreading their influence in their wake. Of the final outcome, Clapton says, I'm very pleased with Marjorie's dress. It took weeks, months even, with all the roses and embroidery. I wanted it to be pretty, but on closer inspection, strong, and to tell the story of her ambition. 
Of the making of the gown, Clapton says, it was a complicated construction, bias cut, and then stretched onto a structured base to give support and to control the fall of the cloth around the waist. The rose covered train was heavy and we boned the hem so that it wouldn't collapse on itself. I don't think it was uncomfortable, but maybe a little heavy to walk in. We only had one of them, so we always worried about food or coffee falling on it, but Natalie is brilliant and very careful. The gown took approximately six weeks to cut and construct, while each fabric rose was hand rolled and stitched. Michelle Carragher says the roses were made from the same fabric as the dress. Strips of fabric were cut on the bias and folded, then rolled into shape and each given a stem of silver wire mesh. Carragher's own part took about six weeks with solid work. She explains that the stems were mainly made from silver plated cord mixed with some of the gimp covered with mesh wire for thicker stems and the thorns were a mix of check glass spikes and silver painted leather cut and molded into shape. The leaves were also cut from fine leather, painted silver in various sizes and then stitched into the st onto the stems on the dress with additional velvet embroidered sprigs and wired leaves. On the front bodice, I used a few small silver metal roses from her brother's armor, further embellished with painted fish scale sequins and Swarovski crystal centers. The briars grow up the bodice but also trail down joining at the front belt like a belt with a central flower that has a pearl and labradorite center with petals made of velvet and crystal organza. The briars flow from the bodice front around the waist and flow down the center back into a cascade of roses spilling onto the train of the dress. Hair designer Kevin Alexander was inspired by a waterfall for Marjorie's wedding hairstyle. It took seven days to film her scenes in this outfit and Natalie Dormer had to go through a two hour process each day to assemble this hairstyle. With the heat we were in, it was a lot for the actress to go through, he said. We used lots and lots of setting lotion. Clapton says, with the crowns, Marjorie is all creeping roses, so it was the idea that slowly Marjorie is beginning to wrap around Joffrey and control him. According to Steenson's Jewelry, the roses were created using copper clay, hand rolling and pressing each petal into shape and slowly building up the petal layers to form the rose. Clapton decided that Tiara needed a thin silver plate to soften the colors and to tie it into the color of Marjorie's wedding dress. After Joffrey's death at the wedding, Marjorie switches to dark morning clothes for the rest of season four. Overall, she wears heavier, less revealing clothing in season five. The black and gold bodice is made from a gorgeous rose pattern silk brocade. According to Clapton, Marjorie wore revealing outfits to impress those around her when she was trying to become queen. But now that she is the queen, she feels she has earned her position and doesn't need to play that act anymore. Here is a close-up of Marjorie's necklace. It was created for her wedding to Joffrey by Steenson's Jewelry using CAD software and cast in sterling silver and rose gold plated. It is hand set with oval and round moonstones, blue topaz and three cubic zirconias. At times for modesty and respect, Marjorie adds this black silk jacquard shawl, like from Tyrion's trial from the episode, The Laws of Gods and Men and the season five opener, The Wars to Come, on the stairs of the Great Sept of Baylor during Tywin's Wake. Notice that the handmaidens wear similar bodices in reverse black jacquard. She wears the same ensemble in season four when visiting Tommen's bedchamber. In the season five episode, High Sparrow, Marjorie marries Tommen in this gold brocade sleeveless gown. Of the gown, Michelle Clapton says, there is gravitas to this costume. Marjorie is queen. In this wedding, Marjorie assumes a more regal role. She doesn't want to scare Tommen, who is gentle, or appear too eager soon after Joffrey's death. Being too sexy would open her up to criticism. Everything Marjorie wears is considered. Her game here is different than with her wedding to Joffrey, which was a much more aggressive kind of triumphant dress, says Clapton. It was full of messages trying to irk Cersei. I wanted this dress to have real weight. It's establishing that Marjorie has arrived. 
I chose the fabric but wanted to enhance it further, so I asked the armor department to create a form of metal armor to sit over it and echo the pattern. And of Marjorie's gold crown, Clapton has this to say. This is actually the same crown that Marjorie wore at Joffrey's wedding. It seemed fitting that it should be the same. In season five, Marjorie's color palette changes to King Tom and Baratheon's family colors. In episode three, the day after her wedding to Tommen, Marjorie greets Cersei in what looks like a bronze, silk jacquard kimono style dressing gown. Marjorie has to have her slant on it, of course, so the gown is much tighter and the neckline is far deeper than any of Cersei's gowns. In fact, it appears that the neckline plunged deeper, but was tacked into place just enough to be respectable. And while Marjorie foregoes wearing a fichu, all these handmaidens dressed in what looks like a set of ill-fitting bridesmaid dresses all have neck scarves tucked into their bodices. A new thing for Marjorie is this gown that features a bronze scrollwork overlay set on top of what looks like a Venetian point lace gown with yellow gold silk lining. On this change for season five, Clapton says, it's funny, I wanted her to be a bit more like Cersei with the metal armor look. Marjorie doesn't need the, to play the, oh, I've hardly got anything on and I'm so young game. She can actually say I'm queen now. In the season 5 episode, Unbowed, Unbent, Unbroken, Marjorie's gown is a simple gold brocade shift. The construction is a much looser fitting drape with a softly flared skirt. Again, she accessorizes the gown with a soft silk shawl. In this scene in which Cersei has orchestrated Marjorie's arrest by the Faith Militant, we get a better look at the fabric of her gown, a natural leaf pattern motif. Upon her imprisonment, the Faith have stripped Marjorie of her royal attire and outfitted her in a simple linen shift. The shift has been, has been distressed to look worn and dirty. Her wig is a natty mess, meant to look as though Marjorie has been housed for days in the cell. But then they clean her up for her visit with Tommen and eventual conversion and alliance with the Faith. Her linen shift looks the same except that it's cleaned and pressed and her hair has been washed and set in a very simple style. From this point forward until her death, Marjorie will sadly never return to her softly tendril hairdos and brocade finery. In one of Marjorie's final looks before the end of season six in the episode Broken Man, Marjorie meets with Elena to convince her to return to Highgarden in fear for her safety. I'll admit this is my least favorite look for Marjorie, but I think I understand interim designer April Ferry's motivation behind the costume. Marjorie, she's pretending to be converted to the faith and what better way than to wear something simple and shapeless. In a return to Jarrell colors, the dusty blue matte lace fabric trimmed in antique gold embroidery is beautiful, but I loathe the boat neck collar with its center front seam, for even as a pious costume, it seems ridiculous for a queen, especially since Marjorie is wearing her crown. And finally, we have this look, designed for the season finale, The Winds of Winter. I cannot confirm or deny if Michelle Clapton designed this dress or not, but I do know from Clapton's interviews that she returned for the final two shows of season six to design both Cersei and Danny's finale costumes. And from the construction and the fabric, I believe that Clapton had some say in it because it has the same cut as Cersei's gown. Both Marjorie and Cersei's gowns have stand-up Mandarin collars. Cersei styled after her dead father Tywin's military-style jackets. Both gowns have seamed, fitted bodices, long tapered sleeves, and long A-line skirts. The dresses are not unlike the cut of Septon Unella's habit. The gowns are both embossed, Cersei's in leather and Marjorie's in a brocade of sorts. And while Cersei's gown is hardened by the silver livery and epaulettes, Marjorie's is softened by her silvery drape fastened at the shoulders. The final thing to note is that the silvery gray fabric of the gown is embossed in what looks like the sigil rose of the house Tyrell. And like the drawing of the rose that she gives her grandmother, Elena, it shows that her loyalties still lie with her family. Sadly, Cersei outmaneuvers her before the end of season six and realizing too late, Marjorie and her family pay with their lives.
Have you got something to add to the conversation? What do you think about my analysis? Do you have a different opinion? Then please add your comment, or if you have a suggestion for future videos, please leave one below. And please remember that it takes several hours of research and time put into each video, so I really appreciate if you can like and share my video. Thank you so much for watching.